thank you so much sir and uh, good afternoon uh, today and uh, yesterday we have uh, uh, heard some fantastic uh, presentations uh, on a wide ranging topics starting from geopolitics to regional security to security uh, terrorism and so on uh, they have made a uh, very good uh, arguments counterpoints and one can easily draw that all those points and counterpoints flow from the fact that the region is going through a process of transition transitions as you know are hardly smooth uh, it is a mostly painful process and uh, when we are talking about transition in a region which is as sensitive and as volatile as west asia then the transition process would have to be more painful violent and bloody and we have seen in last 8 years what has evolved in front of us since 2011 when the protest all began in the world arab world the region is undergoing a process of transition we have seen that uh, the leaders were overthrown couple of them got killed and those fortunate enough survived this wave of transition but that doesn't end the problem of regional stability and regional instability so what we see right now in the north sea is that from protests to violence to civil war to humanitarian crisis and the situation continues to worsen every day but the key question here is how long would the process of transition in west asia continue and what is coming after that but unfortunately none of us here would know that answer for sure as a result of the transition process which is taking more and more time Uh, new terrorist groups have emerged in the region the old ones were always there uh, the 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 environment has become chaotic messy which helps them to survive and thrive in the region we have seen more ungoverned spaces created in the region rather to put it more ungovernable spaces have been created uh, cities have been uh, captured they have been recaptured uh, still we know that there are many places in the region which are under terrorist Uh, occupation more space for external players have been created which was elaborate discussed in the previous session but i am more disappointed with uh, the regional powers in the region uh, when it all began in 2011 uh, most of the players the regional players i'm talking about were basically novices uh, some of them uh, were uh, afraid of their life some other trying their best to uh, save the regimes and rest of them try to aggressively pursue to protect and promote their own national interest so at this juncture at that particular juncture resolving the regional problems was secondary actually so since then the more the things are changing in the region they are only drifting towards more and more uncertainty while the politics goes on I would like to draw your attention toward the evolving the worsening human rights humanitarian situation particularly in Yemen and in Syria. Here are some facts in front of you. Over 22 million people I'm talking about in Yemen first. Over 22 million people according to the UN need humanitarian or protection assistance. That is around 75% of the population. 17.8 million are food insecure that is around 60% of the population of yemen and out of which 8.4 million people are severely food insecure and at the risk of starvation 16.4 million people lack access to adequate health care uh, there was a severe outbreak of cholera in yemen more than 2500 people have been killed and thousands of people are still undergoing treatment UN says Yemen is the world's worst humanitarian crisis and it also says that all the parties to the conflict display a disregard for international humanitarian law and international human human rights law and they impede the principled and timely delivery of humanitarian assistance to the people there in Syria over 13 million people require humanitarian assistance including 3 million which the un says as hard to reach areas 
there are more than 5.5 million Syrian refugees worldwide today. Over half the population has been forced out of their homes. Like in Yemen, in Syria the UN says that the parties to the conflict act with impunity committing violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. You can uh, take a look at the map. The red persons are uh, controlled by the government, the yellow ones by the Kurds, uh, the black uh, person is by ISIS and the rest are by different rebel groups. And to Yemen and Syria one can always add uh, Libya where also more than 1 million people need some kind of humanitarian assistance. And this, is, this situation has emerged as a result of the failure of national dialogues which has taken place uh, at different phases from 2011-12 onwards. In Yemen they call for a national dialogue conference in 2012 where they invited all the uh, segments of the society, the, uh, the government, the opposition, the youth, women, everyone, including the Houthis. Uh, it uh, went on for a couple of years. Houthis were though a part of it. When the, end, uh, when the final uh, document uh, came out, Houthis said they are not in agreement with certain clauses. Uh, so they rejected the document and they started their march towards capital Sana. And rest we know what is happening in Yemen. Similarly, in Syria, that initially there were a Geneva round of talks uh, that couldn't produce anything concrete. Now there are uh, Sochi rounds of uh, talks that has also not been able to produce something concrete. In Bahrain also, they had a Bahrain national dialogue. Uh, the opposition sometime walked out of it and that remains suspended now. In Libya, the national dialogue conference process continues. Uh, UN is mediating, but till now there is no concrete results. We have seen there is excessive use of force by everyone. Everybody is using force. The regime is using force, military, police, even the opposition groups have taken up arms. Terrorists, both old and new, they are also using force. And cessation of violence, the call for ending the violence by the UN and international community has till now fallen in the deep years. As a result, what you see is the fragile states. Earlier they described it as failed states, now they call it fragile states. So the states, more and more states become <coughs> fragile. The security of the state is compromised, security of the citizens is compromised, the national boundaries, the sanctity of the national borders are also being compromised, economy going downhill, social cohesion and harmony is being destroyed, and nobody knows first the next generation of people, those who are witnessing the violence in the countries would grow up as in future. And a sad part is that when this such drastic humanitarian situation, uh, the crisis has emerged, countries in the region, the, including all the major regional uh, powers, are indulged in politics of military and security alliances. This shows their nervousness towards the, uh, the, the protest by the people. <coughs> Initially, uh, the Arab League proposed uh, to establish a joint Arab military force in 2015 and this issue was discussed at length in uh, the Shamel uh, Sheikh Summit in the Arab League in 2015. That has, uh, nothing concrete has come out uh, in this regard. Uh, second and the uh, most important one is the IMCTC, the Islamic Military Center, Military Counter-Terrorism Coalition which is being led by Saudi Arabia and it has uh, 41 member states as of now. And uh, they claim that it is an alliance to fight terrorism and they will operate under the uh, uh, provisions of UN and OIC. Another alliance is the Russia, Syria, Iran, Iraq coalition again in 2015. Uh, their main purpose is to uh, collect information about the ISIS in order to combat them. Uh, but unfortunately though the, the IMCTC and the RSII uh, both of them recognize the Islamic State as the main target, but they don't, they can't join hands together in this regard. So, but the regional, the point is the regional powers should create a conducive environment for dialogue rather than forming military and security alliances at this point of time. And this is also affecting the regional geopolitics. I am taking the example of GCC here, the Gulf Cooperation Council. The GCC was known to be a symbol of unity uh, in the turbulent region 
and uh, as the protest began they are also pulled into the conflict uh, initially when uh, bahrain happened saudi and emirati forces were sent to bahrain uh, the gcc member states have also uh, participated in uh, syria uh, and in uh, libya also and uh, since then as the situation has unfolded the gcc itself which i say was a symbol of unity has developed tracks and it's it reached, it reached a high point last year in june june 2017 uh, when we witnessed that uh, countries like saudi arabia uae bahrain along with egypt cut off their diplomatic ties with qatar so qatar uh, felt isolated and suddenly felt that turkey and iran are two countries where which are eager to engage with so now the geopolitics is unfolding like this on the one hand there is saudi led saudi uae uh, bahrain and egypt and on the on the other hand there is a qatar turkey and iranian partnership which is unfolding in the region today finally when one looks at the future it looks there is a bumpy road ahead as i said transition in non democratic political system is always complicated violent and disruptive there will always be some old regimes and the remnants of the old regimes who will act as hurdles in the transition therefore if not managed properly they can slide back to the uh, old authoritarianism or any other form which is similar to that everyone knows that there is no military solution to the conflict in west west asia today and as of now the political and diplomatic efforts have remained unsuccessful violence has only continued thus leading to the process of transition becoming more painful convulsive and protracted i leave you with that thank you for your attention